to this um, edition, I suppose I can say, of Henderson Speaks. I like that title. You know, it's, it's a whole lot more interesting to, to watch than Henderson Silent. So, and we've got a, a great panel here. Um, just want to ask uh, Lou to come up uh, first. He's got a couple of words to say to, well, Lou, couple words. Huh. Not sure there, but, uh, <laughs> but Lou? Thank you, Mark. Uh, I have a few words, but it won't take long. <laughs> but anyway, uh, good evening. I'm so happy to see so many of you here. Uh, I'm Lou Laporta, obviously, and uh, I'm with the Henderson Historical Society. We're about six, seven years old. Kind of, kind of interesting. But I am delighted that all of you are here. This, this, this really tickles me because the series that we're putting on now are very, very good, and it helps us even in the historical society, and we're pleased to put this one on also. So without saying too much more, I uh, can tell you that the, the lecture series is, is as educational as much as anyone. We learn from it, even though that we're only six years old or seven years old. Uh, as a result of that, we're learning, and I could tell you this much. Will it stop? No. The lecture series, as far as the Henderson Historical Society, you must, must know your history to really know where you're going. So obviously, this evening, you're going to be really pleased to see the panel that we have. But without saying too much more, I'm going to ask something for the audience. How many people, show of hands, how many people have been here since the 40s up to about the 60s? It's just a show of hands. Great. Okay, from that 60 to about 90, how many do we have now? That's what I expected. And that's, that's great. I'm so pleased that you're here. And at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Mark. Mark does all of our, he, by the way, he's, he does a lot of his research, not only at the museum, but he's all over, even including uh, the TV. So without saying anything more, Mark, it's yours. Thank you, Lou. <laughs> oh, you Taking my notes, too. I need those. My memory's good, but not that good. Um, what we're going to do tonight is hear from our panelists what it was like to grow up in Henderson, kinds of things that they did, and what they remember of it. And I think hopefully some of the changes that they've seen. We have a, a really interesting panel here. Um, I'm going to start at this end and work down with my introductions, but then we will start talking from the other end. So just to confuse everybody, we got that here to there, there to here. Um, Their history starts first. Yes, there you go, yes. And by the way, I only got here in 93, so I'm still a newcomer. I don't claim anything else. Um, the, our third speaker of the night will be DJ Allen here. He's the founder and head coach of X's and O's of Success, uh, a leadership development organization which uses the platform of sports and its teachings to help individuals and teams maximize their potential in business and life. Uh, he's a native of Southern Nevada graduate of Henderson's Basic High School, and, the, and in the class of 93, you make me feel old. I want you to know that. Um, you know, you just, you stole my joke though, because I was gonna say we were classmates. <laughs> and the difference, the difference was I drank the Pepcon water. And there you, you go. Didn't, so. <laughs> and he didn't graduate from the real Basic High School. <laughs> there you go. We may ask you at some point how many basic Bs have existed. That's a, it's a great piece of trivia, but I'm, I'm not going to do that to you. Our next speaker, that, that will in fact be the second speaker, is Michael Morrissey, uh, the founding principal of Morrissey Insurance, which he formed in 1986. His career includes numerous professional affiliations and community involvements. 
He was raised in Henderson, and his memories of that town date back to the 1950s. He's an alumnus of the old St. Peter's School. Everybody remember St. Peter's School? Yes? Okay, good. And uh, the one on Boulder Highway, of course. And a graduate of uh, Bishop Gorman's High School class of 1965. And then our first speaker tonight, notice how I'm fitting that in. Yeah, he's going to be first. Our first speaker of the night will be Frank Schreck of Brownstein Hyatt Farber Schreck LLP. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Good, okay. And, uh, or did I get you out of order? Yeah. I did? I'm sorry. No, we're okay. Keep going. Good, okay. <laughs> you guys know who they are. Uh, it's been a long week, let me tell start you. with the oldest guy first. There we go, yes. <laughs> that will work. And, uh, um, Frank has, has 40 years of experience in licensing matters and all other aspects of regulatory compliance. Grew up in Henderson, was an accomplished student. It says right here in my notes. Isn't that good to know? And a good basketball player at uh, basic high school where he graduated in the class of 61. So instead of what I told you, we're going to screw it up anyways. We're starting with Frank um, because he's got the, the first, uh, he's got the first graduation here. And basically what we're asking is, is what do you remember of growing up here? Not just in school, but what was it like just to be in the town at that point as a kid? Is this working? No. Can you turn it on? There it goes. There we go. I'll just leave it. Well, I would, can you hear me? No, I was uh, born in Henderson in, uh, on November 13th, uh, 1943. Uh, thank you. <laughs> my, uh, my parents moved uh, to Henderson in 1941. Uh, like many of the old timers moved here because of the basic, basic magnesium plant. They both were graduates of the University of Arizona. They met there. Uh, my father went back to Chicago and then saw a newspaper ad for a job here and came out to Henderson and uh, was there ever since. And uh, I, uh, we were, my first home was on Kansas Street. Uh, we lived there until they really uh, suburbanized Henderson and built the newer homes on one side of the town and the newer homes on the other side. And we were on, I guess, the, it'd be the south side. I'm directionally challenged, so towards Boulder City. Uh, on Major Avenue, and I, I'll never forget uh, when my parents built the house, it was right at the base of, at the bottom of Major Street before Boulder Highway, and they added like 12 feet onto the end of the house uh, and put a fireplace. And so around the town, you know, we had a mansion. Uh, but it was, uh, the things I remember the most about Henderson, and we'll pass it on, but I, I, and I tell this to people a lot of times, is I wish my kids could have grown up in the environment uh, that I had in Henderson. Uh, they've grown up in Las Vegas, and there's nothing wrong with that, but, but when I grew up in Henderson, you know, the things I tell people, I, you couldn't walk, you know, half a block without somebody picking you up and giving you a ride to where you wanted to go. Major was a long way from downtown. But I, I didn't get a block before somebody had picked me up and give me a ride. Uh, everybody knew one another. We would leave our house open when we'd leave in the summertime and fill it full of the refrigerator full of soft drinks so all the little na our neighbor friends could come in and have Cokes. Nobody, you know, locked their house. Uh, I remember when I heard a public announcement uh, to please take your keys out of your car. Not lock your car, just take the keys out of your car. <laughs> That's when I guess there was a real rampant crime rage in, in, in Henderson. But it was such a pleasant place, you know, to grow up. Uh, you got to know everybody. Uh, everybody socialized. Uh, I, I didn't know anything at all about racism, uh, whether there weren't a lot of uh, African Americans in town, but there were, and a lot of Hispanics, but nobody cared. I mean, it was never even a thought process. Uh, and it was a wonderful, you know, that was a wonderful way to grow up. Uh, I think I had a, a very good education. I was fortunate enough to have as, a, as my world history and U.S. government uh, uh, teacher, Michael Callahan, who is obviously one of the most famous alumni from Henderson. Uh, Mike was uh, just a tremendous guy. Uh, 
uh, he influenced my life a lot and influenced a lot of people that he uh, was a teacher of and then just uh, by being in Henderson, I uh, got to know him. Uh, I, the, some other things I remember, I remember my father uh, went with a group of his Henderson buddies and they went to, uh, it was an old army base or navy base in California uh, after the war and they picked up the church that was there and they put it on a bunch of trucks and hauled it up in that St. Timothy's Church in Henderson. Uh, and I remember growing up and, and my sister and my friends don't believe it, but I was the littlest angel in the, in the Episcopal <laughs> Church St. Timothy's uh, Christmas pageant. And uh, uh, you know, I, I remember all of those things and then, and then going to summer camp up at Lake Tahoe with the, with the church group, it was an Episcopal church camp. Uh, I thought that uh, the people that I had teach me at Basic High School and at Burkholder Junior High School and at Bob Taylor Elementary School were all really wonderful people. I, I, I just saw where one of my dearest friends, uh, uh, Pat Guider, passed away just recently. Uh, and I was sad to see that. Pat was really a, a dear friend. And I remember she was uh, my sixth, I think sixth grade, no, fifth grade teacher, English, kind of taught English. and. And I was in sixth grade and I was misbehaving and so my punishment was to be sent back to her class for one day uh, as a humiliation to be with, with uh, fifth graders. But, uh, you know, we, we've lost a lot of good friends. Uh, just recently I went to a memorial service with Joe Ullum and Jimmy Ullum to, uh, to uh, Louis Shoops, uh, who is a dear friend and a basketball player with me on Basic High School's basketball team. And, you know, we're sad to see at our age, you know, that's happening more and more. Uh, uh, our friends are passing, so it's good to see, you know, that some of the memories are kept alive by people just talking about what happened in Henderson in those old days. But uh, it was it was an experience that, that I think helped form me. Uh, there are a lot of incredible people. I used to tell people that when I grew up in Henderson, you know, it was a blue collar industrial town. There was no question about it. But the people that came out of that town, the kids that came out, if they went, if they got a trade, electrician or a plumber, they ended up owning electrical companies and plumbing companies. They seemed like an, an incredibly level of success of kids that came out of basic high school during the period of time that I knew. They, that whatever venture they chose in life, uh, they succeeded at it. And it's really nice to see. Uh, one of my dearest friends and a classmate of Joe's and mine, uh, probably the richest guy ever come out of uh, basic high school now, uh, Glenn Charles. I don't know if you ever heard of Glenn and Les Charles, but uh, they created uh, Taxi and Cheers. Uh, and Glenn is now, uh, lives in Pebble Beach, plays at Cypress, and has a home in, in uh, Sun Valley, Idaho. So he's living the life. But he did come back to our 50th reunion, which was fun, uh, with his wife. So uh, there's been some really interesting people that have come out of basic high school that were with us. Uh, obviously, Harry Reed, who was a lot older, and I keep reminding him that. Uh, was with my sister, uh, Cookie, who passed away 25 years ago. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I always remember when I, 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 uh, I Michael Callahan had, had a lot of influence on my life. I was going to go and play basketball at USC, and, and my mother and Mike applied to a couple Ivy League colleges, and, and I got into them, and, and Mike looked at me, and he said, Frank, he said, uh, you're not that good of a basketball player. You're gonna have to do. Some, <laughs> you're gonna have to do something out of, after college. So why don't you go back east? I'd never been east of Utah. So he said, go back and you know get an education. And I remember my roommate uh, uh, at Yale was uh, came out and said, you know, I, I can see it now. Uh, uh, your house uh, in Henderson, you have a big neon sign saying Shrek's appearing nightly. <laughs> <laughs> but I never ever told people I was from Las Vegas. I told everybody I was from Henderson, Nevada. And they'd say, where is that? i say, well, it's a few miles outside of Las Vegas. But I would always said I was from Henderson. I've always been proud of being from Henderson, and I never tell people I'm from anywhere else. So at this time, I'll pass on to the young kids. <laughs> um, I, Frank stole everything I was going to say. <laughs> uh, Frank was a few years older than me, but um, 
uh, I always knew who Frank was because he was a really good basketball player, and he went on to play at Yale, which is a pretty big deal, and, and he got to guard Bill Bradley, who was one of the greatest basketball players ever, so Frank was always kind of a hero. But uh, I grew up in Henderson, I grew up in Victory Village, and that's what I remember most. I, I did move to Major Avenue when I was about 13 years old, and ironically, I lived at the top of Major, and Frank, in those days, Major didn't go across the freeway, or across the road there. It ended, he lived at the last house, I lived from the second to the last on the other end. So I was always walking by his house. And you, you brought up something I remember very well too, and that is you really couldn't walk anywhere that somebody didn't give you a ride. And I went to school at Gorman, and so I had to go 13 miles to school every day. And a lot of times I didn't have a ride, so I would have to hitchhike. And I would get the same people giving me a ride to school um, maybe three or four times a week. Same guy would stop and say, hey, come on. I'll give you. And it was, it was always kind of fun that you had somebody you knew. And I mean, it was Henderson people. But um, I was talking, Sig Rogish was going to be here tonight, and he couldn't make it. And he and I were talking about Henderson and, and the things that happened to us. And um, I, uh, I used to go down to Phillips Radio and TV, which was at the bottom of Victory Village. And it was a strip center. And it had a grocery store in it and it had this radio shop. Remember, Lou? What, what's Phillips? Wasn't it called Phillips? And he used to always leave his um, TV on over the weekends so you could go down and watch TV because none, none of us had a TV. <laughs> And so the kids would go down there and watch TV, and I always hear that Sig Rogich was going down to watch a game, and I'd always want to go. He lived in 10, I lived in 107D, and he was 119B. So I mean, that's how you knew each other, you know. And so I would go down to Al Phillips to watch the, um, not Al Phillips, but the Phillips Radio to watch the games. And Ohio State had this um, uh, great running back called Hopalong Cassidy. And there was also a cowboy named Hopalong Cassidy that was in, I don't know if you guys remember all this. And so Sig became an Ohio State Buckeye fan because of, of the TV that was on all the time. So years later, um, Sig and I still hang around a lot together. And I have my little boy Sean's here tonight. And um, I'm a big Notre Dame fan. And uh, Sig turned him in, into an Ohio State Buckeye fan just to irritate me. <laughs> but it all started from Phillips. Uh, 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 store down there. But I'll tell you another quick sports story. So a neighbor finally got a TV, and it was one of those great big TVs, but it, the screen was about this big. <laughs> and he invited us to go down. It was Bucky Faulkner. Do you remember Bucky Faulkner? So his, uh, they invited us down to his, his apartment. There were four apartments to a row in, in Victory Village. So we all went down there. There's like 20 of us in there. We watched a football game, and it was Oklahoma played Notre Dame. And I was probably 12 years old or whatever. And um, Oklahoma gets beat by Notre Dame. And they had a 48-game winning streak. And Bud Wilkinson was the coach. And it, But it, anyway, during the game, Notre Dame scores. My dad goes crazy. And I, I said, what, what's so exciting? He says, well, he says, your uncle scored. Dick Lynch scored for Notre Dame. And Notre Dame beats Oklahoma. So I go back to St. Peter's grade school. And I tell everybody there that my uncle scored for Notre Dame. <laughs> And then I write Notre Dame, and in those days, if you wrote a school, they would send you glossies of their players. So they sent me a bunch of glossies. So my whole room was Notre Dame football players. And, I mean, I just I fell in love with Notre Dame. So years later, I said to my dad, um, hey, Dad, how come um, uh, Uncle Dick doesn't come out and see Mom? <laughs> my mom was a Lynch, and this guy's Dick Lynch. And he looked at me and said, what are you talking about? I said, Mom's brother, Dick Lynch, you know, scored for Notre Dame. And he says, oh, I just made that up. <laughs> so anyway, that's how I ended up being a Notre Dame fan, and that was the end. <laughs> but on another sports note, I, when I had to move out of Victory Village, when I say had to move, I was pretty happy in Victory Village. I think all of us that lived there didn't know it was not the best place to live. Um, but we were moving to Major Avenue, and Frank Schreck lived on Major Avenue, so I figured... You know, good basketball players, you know. So, anyway. But um, I really enjoyed uh, Victory Village. My, one of my best friends was actually Pete Laporta, uh, Lou's son, Pete. And we grew up together for, and stayed together for years and years. And um, actually, I got my first uh, job, my real first real job when I was about 28. Before that, I was always doing kind of goofy things. But I came back to um, Henderson, and I went to work for Lou. 
And so Lou started my career and has been uh, my mentor ever since. And so uh, what success I have, I, I credit Lou. He did a great job with this. Uh, St. Peter's Grade School. Great place to go to school. Um, I love the place. It was, um, it was fun. Um, it wasn't any different, I don't think, from the public schools. I mean, we all knew all the public school kids. They all knew us. It wasn't like we were real so sort of different. And uh, the only thing that became difficult was when I went to Gorman, I played sports, and whenever I came home, if I hitchhiked home, somebody dropped me off at the Polar Queen, and I'd have a Gorman Letterman's jacket on, and it didn't go well with the basic, the basic bulls. So I, I hate telling these stories in front of my wife, who's here tonight, because she's, she's heard them so many times. But the Polar Queen was right across from the El Dorado Casino. And that's where everybody went to get Cokes and French fries. So I get, a, I get a ride one night, and a guy drops me off the Polar Queen, and there I've got this Gorman jacket on, and um, Dennis England and a couple of these other guys were there from basic high school, and they said, you know, Morsi, you better get out of here. The tough guys are going to be here pretty soon, and you're not going to want to be here when they get here. And just then, sure enough, the tough guys come in. I could tell you who they were, but... Uh, so they, they pulled up, and um, so I had this boat of french fries. Remember, I used to get those little paper boats and french fries, and, and I turned away from these guys because I was getting out of the car, and I spit all over my french fries. <laughs> and I turned back around, and sure enough, the toughest guy came right over to me and got in front of me and started eating my french fries and said, Morrissey, you don't belong here. You need to get, you know, you go to Gorman, and you don't belong in a basic, uh, basic place. So just then, England and a couple of these guys, you could see them starting to back up because they realize this is not good. These guys are going to figure out these french fries were bad. <laughs> and so I did the manly thing. I dropped them, and I ran all the way home. <laughs> so I, I get home, and the next day I go to school, and I tell, uh, does, does anybody in here remember the Bates family? Yep. Okay. So then... Back in the old days, there were three families that were the toughest families in town. I don't know if they ever got in any fights, but nobody ever messed with the Sullivans, the Vincents, or the Bates brothers. They, they controlled the town. That's all there was to it. So um, I went and saw the Bates boys because they went to Gorman. I said, I got a problem. I said, I got in this trouble last night, and these guys are going to get me. And, you know, I hitchhike to school all the time, so I can't walk the streets in Henderson now. You know, these guys will be chasing me every night. They said, okay, we'll take care of it. And so they went out the next night, and they sat there and waited till the tough guys came to the Polar Queen, and they had a talk with them and told them they're not to touch Morrissey and to leave me alone. And so I was kind of... <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of the end of the story until I ran into a friend of mine a few months back, and he said, hey, did you see Gary Bates died? And I said, yeah, I know, it's terrible. And he says, you know, he's the last of the Bates brothers. And there was about four Bates brothers. And I said, yeah, all, that whole family's gone now. And he says, you know, that's bad news for you. And I said, why is that? And he says, if those guys out in Henderson figure out the Bates brothers are gone, you're in trouble. <laughs> Vincent's are still around. Yeah, Vincent's, well, Vincent's weren't after him. Some other guys. But uh, I, I felt the same way Frank did. I think Henderson was a great place to grow up. I loved it. Um, I never told anybody I was from Vegas. I was always from Henderson. Um, I really enjoyed, and even to this day, when I meet somebody from Gorman High School who now lives in Henderson, and I always tell them I knew you guys would make it there someday, <laughs> you know. And uh, but no, I've, I've, I'm proud of Henderson. I really enjoy it. It's one reason why I came tonight is because I, I think it's fun, and um, so thank you for having me. I just wanted to do one add-on uh, to show how tough the Sullivans and the Vincents were. Uh, one of our annual affairs was uh, building Christmas tree forts when we were kids. And there would be one big one up where the Vincents were and one big one down where the Sullivans were. And then we did kind of a mediocre one in the middle. But I'll never forget one year, somebody had the first white Christmas tree, flocked Christmas tree. So that was the prize. It went, you raided the other guy's forts, you stayed all night, to dug, we dug underneath one of them one time to go steal it. And uh, even though these were maybe the toughest kids in town, they were always obviously really nice and great guys to, to have fun with. <laughs> uh, 
you know, it's interesting. Uh, been talked earlier about, hey, Frank, you know, he's the, the basic guy and the basic hero. I, I've maybe met Frank one time over, over the last 20 years, but any time I would tell people I'm from basic, uh, and, and as we do work here locally, people bring up certain people, and they're just kind of, everybody's a basic guy. Oh, yeah, because there's kind of this fraternity, and, and Frank was one of those guys, like, the name would always come up, that when they kind of find out, oh, you're, you're born and raised in Henderson, um, and I am, and obviously my, my story's a little bit different. Um, are actually here today, Larry and Marilyn Allen. Uh, they're 65, 1965 graduates of BASIC. Um, they didn't sell out and go to Gorman. Um, <laughs> that's what we did, it's a joke. But they both moved here. Uh, my dad's family from Utah in the uh, 50s, my mom's family from Arizona, uh, like, like many people. So I, I heard from them the passion that they had for this city. In fact, my mom in the 80s was kind of the unofficial historian of Henderson and put together these old VHS tapes and she'd be asked to go around town and, and deliver it. And I think that's where I got a big love uh, for the city from. But I, I think about my era, being born in 1975, graduating basic in 93, there's a little bit of bridge of our community of what it was. I, I got to taste a little bit of the kind of the romantic era, if you will, of it being the small little town. I um, was part of a group when I was in third grade that won first place grand grand prize for the Industrial Days Talent Show. Um, you know, felt, felt pretty good about that in third grade. Um, you know, at the Boys and Girls Club, and when I was eight years old, I was Athlete of the Month. And unfortunately, that might have been the uh, <laughs> pinnacle of my athletic career. Um, true story, I mentioned that about 15 years ago. I was hosting something for the Boys and Girls Club of Henderson, and I'm on, I was on their board at the time. And, and um, then Regent, uh, Steve Sisolak, heard the story and, uh, you know, wanted to see the, the, the trophy. And I apologize to mom. At some point, I probably threw that out. So a month later, I see him, and he made me a plaque that says uh, Athlete of the Month, Henderson Boys and Girls Club for May 1983. <laughs> um, but, but I talk about that with a, a bridge, because I went to C.T. Sewell, and then I went to Brown a couple years after Brown opened. So it was starting to happen where not all the kids went to the same school. Uh, then I went to basic high school. Um, but... You know, I, I got to experience uh, a, a lot of that small town Henderson. Uh, but at the same time, and I think they can talk, and you experienced it much more than me, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time with that. But there were other things that happened, and I think in my life since, have shaped that, you know, when, when Frank talks about that spirit of Henderson, and he wishes he could have raised his kids in that, um, I actually, it, I know this sounds weird. We, we, I'm one of the few people, I, I was talking to my parents a little bit about this. As I understand, I don't bring a lot as far as some of the older history. But there's probably not many people in this room who, who spent 20 years plus in, in kind of the, the downtown area of Henderson and the last 20 years in West Henderson. Um, and that, I think that's a unique perspective. I was a junior in high school, and I was voted, you know, my senior year, most spirited when Green Valley High School opened. And it was, there was, uh, and, I, and I coached a Little League All-Stars for Henderson Little League when Green Valley was really, really good and brand new. And I think it was a dark time, quite candidly, for Henderson. I, it was. And, and there's a lot of people in this room who are probably still here at Green Valley and kind of, it was a dark time because I was taught by people I looked up to at the time, this did not come from my parents, to hate this new thing. There was hate, and, and it was very interesting because, so here I am, you think about my formative years, I'm 17, I'm 18, when I'm 18 years old, I began writing for the Henderson Home News at sports, and I got assigned to cover basic high school and Green Valley High School, and they were supposed to be the devil, because that's what these people I grew up with had kind of said. And they were some of the nicest, most, uh, most sincere people I'd ever met. And, I th and, and listen, I know there are stories about people who say, I don't live in Henderson, I live in Green Valley. There's not as many as we like to think there were. I, I, was, I was friends with Ben Stepman the last few years of his life, did work with him, and it's true. He wouldn't sell a car to somebody if they wouldn't say they're from Henderson, they sit from Green Valley. That's true. And he'd always use the line, and I know... My dad, you know, has used the line like, well, if your house catches on fire, make sure you call the Green Valley Fire Department, uh -huh, right? <laughs> there are those stories. But 
it, it was interesting because Green Valley was actually the first master plan community in this nation that was as successful as it was. And it was new to everyone. It was, a, it was marketing. And I think we took it so personally. We took it like it was an attack, and it wasn't. And I feel that I was very blessed because at 18, 19 years old, I began to have to almost be forced. I, I, I would go cover Green Valley games like, I'm doing something bad. I'm doing something wrong. And there were some amazing people that are still friends to this day. And, and I say that for this reason now as we come up on, you know, I know we're not 300,000 people, but my wife and I did marry a... I married a, an out-of-towner. I married a girl from Vegas. Um, but the, the rule was I'd never live in Vegas. So 19 years ago, we, our, our anniversary was uh, yesterday. 19 years ago. Yeah, she is a lucky woman. I mean, let me tell you. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we moved to... It was Eastern, and at the time, Lake Mead Parkway is now St. Rose. And I, would always, I always had to have a Henderson address. And our kid, 19 years later now, we've lived within about two, in, in three different houses, raised our family. I have a 16-year-old, a 14-year-old. And both kids are now at Coronado High School. Both kids went all three years to the same, um, same middle school. Both kids went all years to the same elementary school. My son yesterday made his high school basketball team. Probably not as much of a baller as Frank, <laughs> but he can ball a little bit. And my wife and I are talking about there's a kid on the team that he played with you know, when they were six or seven years old. There's a sense of community all over Henderson that still exists because of what this community started. Um, you know, we've worked with economic development. I've had an opportunity to work all over the nation now, and people know the Vegas Valley, and, and people know Summerlin, and they know Henderson. And that's where people now, when they're going to move here, they say, do we move to Summerlin, do we move to Henderson? And there's one difference, is, is, and people say it. They say, Henderson feels different. And, and I think that's, that's important that these years later, it's not romantic like it was. I get it. It's, it's not where we know the three, the, the three families in town. Um, you know, I, when we were younger, I mean, I, I, everybody thought we were LDS. We weren't. I was catching free rides home from, uh, from the carpool. Um, in fact, my wife and I, we would hang out when we were younger with a group of completely LDS uh, families. Literally, we're the only non-LDS family. I remember walking in one night for game night. There's about 15 couples there. Kid you not, we walked in late. My friend Chad yells out, fill up the bathtub. The Allens are here. <laughs> um, but it was just, so like I said, we, we got that small community of the people we grew up with. And, and I know it's, it's, change, it's, it's changed a bit. Um, but, uh, you know, one, one of the ways where it was small town, I don't have a lot of the good, mem the good stories like you guys do, but um, my best friend, who, who when I was in eighth grade, ninth grade, still my best friend today. He, he's actually uh, 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 with the, the police department, but his brother was with the de police department at the time. And we had ourselves, we called a, our group of friends D-Mob. And it's because my name was DJ, his last name was Dennison, another friend's name was Dion, another friend's last name was Dietrich. So we were really creative. And d <laughs> And we used to put shoe polish, well, just white shoe polish. It washed off easily. It D-mob, and we had a logo. And, but, I mean, we were, just, we were just, we were good kids from Henderson, you know, but just, yeah, having a little fun. One day, Walt's brother, who was a, an officer, a, a couple-year officer with the police department, called Walt and said, Walt, just need to tell you a little story today from uh, one of our briefings. I said, okay. He goes, they were going over local gangs in Henderson. <laughs> and they said D-mob. And, and I just started laughing at him and told him it's just a bunch of kids who, you know, wouldn't get in a fight if you paid them. Um, so that was fun. That, you know, the, the, so there, that's why I'm saying we got a little bit of that. Um, but I lived through being involved with the Henderson Chamber of Commerce. I'm a, a chairman from a couple years ago. And I think the pride that my parents taught me, um, the pride that, that, that you're hearing up, to, up here that, that Mike and Frank are talking about was instilled in me. It's still there today, and it's all throughout Henderson. And, and I thank you for that. Uh, I, I, I do. I really thank you for that because it's a special place. Um, and, and like you know, Frank said, there is still a spirit that you can raise kids here. And, and I'm seeing it because we have a 16-year-old and a 14-year-old, and they've been born and raised in Henderson, and I wouldn't have had it any other way. Two other things I want to close my time with, and then we could have a, our... our our discussion. 
And Michael Callahan, it's amazing how his name comes up. And I had an opportunity to intern with the Henderson Home News. Uh, Mike was out working out of the Las Vegas Sun office at that time, but I'd see Mike about every six months. And, and my parents uh, had him as a teacher as well. I had Mr. Horn. I think we pro probably all had Mr. Horn, actually. Um, but uh, he knew I liked sports, and he was a big sports fan, so he'd always, he'd always make me sit down for a couple minutes and give a life lesson. And the li last life lesson that he gave me, the last time I talked to him before he passed away, he told me, DJ, don't ever talk up to anyone, and don't ever talk down to anyone. And that changed my life. And, you know, I think my parents taught me to never talk down to anyone. But to never talk up to anyone, you know, coming from a kid who, who didn't come from a lot in Henderson, changed my life. And, I mean, directly to how I talk to certain people in my life. We were talking about Lon Kruger. If, if you want to talk about a, a conversation I had with him, the former UNLV coach who I ended up writing a book with that ended up changing my life, was because I did not talk up to him. And that was directly from a, a Michael Callahan. Um, but I want to end and, and kind of end with a little basketball story. So I've gotten in the basketball world, and on uh, October 1st, a young man who played basketball at basic high school uh, for four years, Quentin Robbins, and his family's been around for a long time, the Robbins, Wells, Walkers, it's all, as we know in Henderson, it's, it's, uh, it's close. Well, he was killed on, uh, on October 1st, and I didn't know Quentin um, himself. I, I knew family members. Well, on, uh, on, uh, we were at Coronado, and we were hosting a basketball tournament. And uh, what the Coronado coach did is very close to Leonard Taylor, who's the head coach at BASIC. I went to school with him at BASIC. And we honored Quentin. And everybody wore BASIC strong shirts, and it was all about Quentin. His family was there. And they asked me to say a few words because I was uniquely tied to Coronado and to BASIC. So I said a few words as, as before we introduced Leonard Taylor. After we introduced Coach Taylor, I... We took a, a moment of silence, and I ended it with, once a wolf, always a wolf. And, and the Coronado coach afterwards grabbed me and goes, did you just come up with that? <laughs> right? Because he didn't know. He didn't know. And, and this is okay for a gale to hear. It's okay. <laughs> because here's the thing. And, and I just told him, I said, no. I said, it's been something that we've said for a long time. And I know other schools say it at other places. But he was like, that was really impactful. And I thought of it as I was driving home that night that it wasn't just about being a basic wolf. It was about Henderson. Like, once you've, once you've been in Henderson, you're always from Henderson. And so I know I take a different look, and I've had some weird stuff. I mean, I was involved with changing industrial days to heritage days. <laughs> I've, been, I've been involved with, Hender you know, with all those changes of, of Henderson and the growth. I worked for the Henderson Home News during some weird times. Um, but I just want to thank you. I, I want to thank not only the gentleman to my left, but I want to thank you because you created a spirit here that sets this place apart even today, and my kids are benefiting from it. So I'll, I'll ask the audience at this point, do we need to move DJ over to this side of the stage <laughs> for having done that to, to industrial days? I just... Okay, you're not going to throw anything. I'll move over there if you are. Just want to be sure here. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you. You've answered one of them, but I want to I ask it specifically. And this is for all three of you. And this was a question I was asked when I was talking to some folks about doing this tonight. And it was, was Las Vegas any kind of draw for when you were in, I don't know, high school as a place to go to? Not, not that you didn't identify as a resident of Henderson, but, but was Las Vegas, was Fremont Street, was anything there a draw for you as, say, high school, when you, when you had the ability to get there? Yeah, I think that's the main thing is when we had, uh, were old enough to drive our cars. And, yeah, I, there was, uh, uh, most of you know who Larry Ruvo is, uh, who created the... Cleveland Clinic and and the mental and the and the brain health center, uh, but Larry's parents had their first restaurant was right down at the base of, of Boulder Highway and and Charleston, and we would stop there on our way to go to a movie in Las Vegas. That they they I think the theater had closed in Henderson, 
uh, which also, I'll just digress for a second, I remember when I went to the movies in Henderson as a little kid, uh, my parents gave me a quarter, and that got me all the candy I could eat at, we used to call her Jip and Julie, it was, uh, she, ran the, she ran the thing and tried to short us on change periodically, and her husband was the mayor. <laughs> But then we got as much candy as we could eat and, 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 and price of admission into the movie theater for a quarter. That shows you how times have changed. But uh, uh, what was the question? I see I'm getting yeah, old. Sure. <laughs> it was Las huh? Vegas draw. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was. I mean, because there are things in Las Vegas you didn't have. It. The movie theater was closed, so you went to the movies. Uh, uh, they had restaurants when everybody went on graduation night uh, or prom night. You went to the Aku Aku or mm -hmm. some of the old restaurants that were around there because there wasn't really a place to go uh, in Henderson, so all of us did that. But I just want to add one thing. Uh, when I left Basic High School, we hadn't lost any major sport to Gorman High School. Uh, that hasn't been the same since the last 50 years. <laughs> but we beat him in the semifinals for the state championship in football, and we beat him in basketball. And so Gorman never uh, had our number until the year after that. I actually played on the team that beat Basic High School for the first time. And <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this is really kind of funny. Uh, growing up, I always wanted to be a Basic Wolf. And when they built the new high school from downtown and, and uh, built the new one, they put up this uh, neon wolf on the wall. And before the players came out, they shut all the lights off in the gym and just had the Basic Wolf up there. And they played the fight song. And my goal was, I was someday I wanted to come out and be a basic wolf. And so things changed, obviously, I went to Gorman, and it just kind of lost a little something. We finally got to beat basic, but, you know, it wasn't the same. I, I always wanted to be a wolf coming out of that, but I'm glad it happened, and I like to rub it in every once in a while. Hey, I'm talking just about the, um, the attraction of Las Vegas. For me, it was a little bit different because I was going to high school in Las Vegas, so um, I was there every day. But when I was younger, <clears throat> or even coming back from college, one of the attractions about going to the movies in Las Vegas was Lou Laporta. And Lou, you probably don't know this, but Lou uh, was a county commissioner for years and years, and he had a great parking place in the, in the county building. It had his name on it. And nobody could park there except for Pete and I. So, <clears throat> so the attraction was we had a great parking place in downtown Las Vegas. I don't know if he ever told you. But uh, so th there was an attraction to Vegas, but uh, and then it really the old theater downtown Henderson, that was where we went on Friday nights. That was a big deal. I mean, I think everybody did for years and years. And Frank was right; a quarter got you in the movies and candy and everything. Uh, it was a it was a good place to get to see everybody. And we were actually a little bit different because um, I, I had heard the stories about cruising Water Street, going to the movies. Um, the, the Cynodome there on Boulder Highway wasn't built until I think my senior year in high school. We actually went for a time where we didn't have, I mean, the, the, the old what, upstairs at the Rainbow was done. I mean, we didn't have a movie theater. We had to go out. It was D.I. and Lamb, I think, is where we went. I tried, you know, if we'd have a date or something like that. Um, and, and we didn't cruise Water Street. I mean, that was different, obviously. That was, so we were actually forced out to Vegas, if you will. We did, I remember one summer, uh, kind of kids, you know, started to drive, and, and, and one of our friends had a really nice, it was basically an OJ Bronco. Before It was the OJ Bronco, really nice <laughs> Bronco. And he had a, 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 I mean, parents, you know, were doing okay, and they had a, had a car phone. This was before cell phones. And we, we did, we went and cruised the Strip, and, and I guess you, this is before they had the, the limits for, for ages. We were probably one of the last years where they did it. And of course, I think you're going to, you know, six guys sitting in a truck. Apparently, you think you're going to meet, you know, Mrs. Wright five <laughs> seconds as you drive down. Uh, but I remember with that, it had the car phone, and we thought we were hot stuff. And my buddy Rod Dietrich from DMOB um, <laughs> would have the car phone with the cord. And I remember he'd hang out, like, at the corners of going, hey! for you yeah. to anybody driving by and we thought we were funny um so we 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 didn't actually we almost had to go um haircuts super cuts was really big at the time so four or five of us would pile in a car walt would usually drive and we'd all show up at school the next day fresh with haircuts because we had to go out to vegas i think it was chop and, and pecos we didn't have a super cuts at the time again i know it's different um but i i have one little water street story 
and, and then uh, turn it back is um, I, when I was working at the paper, going to school, I fell into, uh, um, there used to be a, a radio station right there on Water Street that it broadcast from there. The business offices weren't there, and at the time it was 94.1 Jams had just changed over, so I became a uh, kind of a night sidekick, but I didn't want to use my real name, so I just went by Paperboy because I was writing for the paper, and I'd go in two or three nights a week and became kind of this reoccurring theme, and, and I wanted to get into broadcasting. And one night, now I'm starting to talk about cops a lot here. It's kind of scaring me for being a pretty good guy. Uh, one night, we, we just, the, the on-air host started joking that there was another intern there that night that we were holding him hostage. And it was all a joke. I mean, he was, he, they're going to, he's going to narrow my, they're going to narrow my legs and, and stupid stuff like that, right? But this is, where I, this is where I first began to understand the power of media and the bad power of it. So we're doing this for about an hour and a half or whatever. It's just a, a big joke. All you have to do is listen for 30 seconds. You know, it's a joke. And then um, all of a sudden, the phone rings in the studio, and it's News 13 calling about this hostage situation. <laughs> and so but he's on the air, and he tells me, DJ, we just go check out front? They say there's like some activity out in front of the station or whatever. And I remember this is about 1993, 94, you know, so I'm, well, it's slow on Water Street. Um, and, and so I go outside and I look out, and this is this old house. Um, and I look out the window and I see a flashing light. I don't think much of it. I open up the window and there's guns on both sides of my head. Uh. Get out, get out, get out! <laughs> Hands behind your head! So here I am about 10 o'clock at night, this great son of Henderson, handcuffed on my knees in the middle of Water Street because we were going to nair a guy. So besides that, I didn't spend a whole lot of time on Water Street except for marching in parades. Well, I remember my one run-in with the law in Henderson. It was not quite as exciting, but uh, one of the things that we used to do as young kids that we would sleep out at night in the summertime. And, and as you go up the streets, people would have great vines and people have peach trees and plum trees and stuff and so the idea was you'd sleep out and then about two in the morning or three in the morning you'd get up and you'd go raid everybody's fruit and stuff and I remember one time we did that it was but it was morning and you could see us and all of a sudden somebody <laughs> somebody called the police and in those days if you remember we had Chief Chrysler and uh, Sergeant Perkins who was like kind of Barney Fife <laughs> and so we were getting stuff, and all of a sudden we saw the chief's car on one street, you know, kind of going down Kansas. And so we'd run across the alley and get up the neck, then we'd see his car go this way, and we kept going. <laughs> Finally, when we got up to where the fire station was, uh, we were apprehended and, uh, <laughs> with our bag of fruit. So that, that was my only run-in with the law in Henderson. Uh, I, I didn't go to jail in Henderson. <laughs> But my, my brother, Patrick, who's six years younger than me, did go to jail in Henderson. And he went to jail. He, he was out in front of our house on Major Avenue, and a police car went by. And he and his buddy stuck their finger up in the air and yelled at the police car. Just you know, Val knows my brother. He's a little bit of a handful. And the policeman didn't think that was funny. He came back. He arrested both of them and took them downstairs and, or downtown for an hour or whatever. And they got in trouble. But what the... the Key to the story is, who was the guy that was with my brother? Well, the guy that was with my brother is a guy named Tommy Burns. Tommy, <laughs> Tommy Burns turned out to be the police chief for, yeah. of, of Henderson. So if you, if you ever see Tommy Burns, they say, hey, didn't you and Pat Morsey go to jail together and <laughs> see what he says? You know, I want to tell another quick story. It's a kind of a Henderson story. And I was laughing when you said you get rides, even though you weren't LDS, they thought you were or whatever. Um, does everybody in here know Bruce Woodbury? I mean, I imagine everybody that grew up around here knows Bruce Woodbury. He has a house across, we have a house up in Utah in a little town called Paraguna, Utah. It's right outside of Parowan, and it's just a little bitty old town. There's, what do you think, Pat, 500 people in it? 500 people. So Bruce has a house right across the street from us. I mean, ironically, he's been up there for as long as we have, 25 years or whatever. And one day he stops me and he says, you know, Mike, you got to do me a favor. You got to quit putting your beer bottles and your wine bottles in my garbage. <laughs> and I said, well, why is that, Bruce? He says, because when they come and empty the garbage, 
everybody in here thinks I'm drinking, and, and there's 500 Mormons in that town and us, you know. So if you see Bruce Woodbury, he says, Mike Morsey, stop putting beer bottles in your, in your garbage. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yeah, let me just tell one other thing of, of guys, guys, guys in advance. All this stuff is, this all these memories are coming back now. I remember when I graduated from law school and I was back in Henderson, my mother said, there's one thing you can't do or I'll disown you. And I said, well, what's that? And she said, go to Henderson and get arrested by Jim Golf, who is the chief of police, who, who is a big juvenile delinquent when we grow up, and be tried by Delwyn. Nice. Okay. Is Delwyn here? Where are you? You never got me. <laughs> but he's up here just in case. Uh, right there? A um, couple of other things for you. And as, as, and let's go with grammar school. Because in grammar school, you don't tend to go real far from home. And you make your own fun a lot of times you know, what it is that you're doing. We, we, we now know about, you know, what one of our panelists did to get arrested in front of the radio station. We know about fruit thievery and, and that, but, but what did you do as, as, as young children in your neighborhood? What kind of games did you play? What did, you know, just, so what, what was it like here in, in your areas? Uh, it, it was really easy. Your parents, if it was summertime, your parents threw you out of the house at 8 o'clock and said, come back when it's dark. <laughs> and that's about what you did. And you would go out in the desert and you'd chase lizards or, or get forts built, like Frank was talking about, you'd build forts. And that's what you did all day long. And um, we never had any sunscreen. We never had any water. And uh, <laughs> hard to believe we all lived through it. But that's what we, we did for, for fun was we were outside all the time, which was really pretty good. I was talking to my brother Pat when I told him I was going to come to this, and, I, and he started laughing and started talking about things. And he said, well, Mike, just think about the things in Victory Village that were fun when we were kids. And he listed a bunch of things that were small things, but they were really fun. And one would be like Halloween. When you had four apartments in one unit, you could walk to four different apartments in, in seven minutes and get candy. So Halloween was like a big deal. You were all over your neighborhood in a, in a few minutes, and you saw everybody, and it was really kind of a, a fun time that, that you would, uh, you'd really enjoy. Um, it, the floods in the old days were just like the floods they have now, only our flood system was worse, obviously. So it was a great time for us to go play in the in the in the water and 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 it was nobody really drowned nobody had a problem um so i mean we did just fun stuff outside all the time and we didn't have the fear of of any bad people or i don't ever remember anybody being kidnapped i don't ever remember anything anything like that happening at all so it was really pretty much um uh, a, a safe easy place to be to grow up Yeah, I was lucky when I grew up in, on Kansas Street, every house had two or three kids. I, the Pittses lived right next to me, and the Browns lived next to me. Uh, we had a, a, and we always had games. You, you know, you, you had kick the can, uh, you know, uh, Red Rover, Red Rover. And, but I remember one of the ones I loved the most is that we would get uh, uh, sticks and stuff and then and get rubber, we'd take tires and we'd, bike tires, and we'd cut off the rubber on them and make bands, and then we'd stretch them across the thing and have a, a clothes pit. Right. I don't know if you yeah, guys had those that, fights, yeah. and then we used to, we, and then guys got real smart. They got big, long boards and great big pieces, and <laughs> those created welts, so our parents <laughs> kind of stopped us from doing that, but my, my elementary school was bifurcated. Uh, some of you that were there knew that my, both my parents worked at, at, in the plants, and uh, 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 the elementary school went on half day one year. And my parents were not going to allow me to be alone for a half a day. They, they were afraid for the neighbors, not, not for necessarily for me. So I went to St. Peter's Parochial School uh, for one year. Uh, and it's an experience I'll never forget. Because uh, I remember the, uh, 
the teacher that I had, her name was Sister Gervais. We used to call her German face. <laughs> and uh, it would be where if you were talking to somebody, it, this is before corporal punishment was outlawed, the, a, an eraser would come and hit you in the head, or all of a sudden you'd be sitting there and whack on your hand with a thing. So it was, St. Peter's was a, was, a, was a great experience for me. You probably needed it, you know. <laughs> So I went, to, I went to C.T. Sewell and grew up just a couple blocks away, so everything was walking distance. Uh, friends played a lot of uh, football in the street, tag, tag football, not necessarily at, at the, the park. Uh, but it was kind of interesting because my, my family uh, weren't big sports fans. And I always like to say, when it, in some ways, I'm like a generation older, because when I was six years old, I found Vin Scully and the Dodgers on transistor radio. I mean, almost like I was in New York in the 50s. And I would, you know, fall asleep many nights with, with Vin under my bed, uh, under the pillow. Not Vin himself, Vin and, and, the, um, and, and the Dodgers. But I love sports. I love baseball. I love baseball cards. And in the 1980s, they started getting very popular in the late 80s. I worked in a baseball card shop. But what I did most of the time, and then I'm going to fast forward to how this kind of came back to haunt me a little bit, is I would just, I, I spent a lot of time with myself, I, I, I kind of with my baseball cards, or in my room, I'd, you know, have fake stats, and I'd just listen to baseball, I'd go outside and pitch against the wall, but I had fake stats, I just spent so much time with myself, and in my head, I had all these seasons and, and everything, and I wouldn't always win, that's kind of crazy to me, um, but... <laughs> Fast forward, it is October 2001. I'm on a bus going to the retreat for Leadership Henderson. It's the second Leadership Henderson program ever put on by the Henderson Chamber of Commerce. And I'm sitting with a guy named Rick Smith. And if anybody knows Rick Smith, he was with American uh, Nevada Corporation uh, throughout the 80s. and Just a great guy. And Rick's, Rick's about my father's age, but we click. And what's supposed to happen is once we get to where we're going and we're going to Mesquite for the retreat, we're supposed to introduce our new friend. So I know nothing about Rick, but right away we hit. We're talking about family, we're, we're talking about our love for Christ, and we're talking about sports. We're talking about the Dodgers, the Cowboys. So I tell him what I just told you, how I spent all this time uh, kind of uh, alone and, and, and playing sports in the backyard in my room. So I'm so excited that he's going to introduce me. Now remember, I'm 25 years old. I'm even more insecure than I am today. And he's going to introduce me to these other 20 people. I'm the youngest person uh, in the program, and, and, and you're going to be with these people for the next nine months. All of a sudden, it's our turn to introduce each other. And if you know Rick Smith, Rick's got some showmen in him. He's from Texas. And he went from being this really nice, laid-back guy on the bus to all of a sudden he turns into Yosemite Sam, right? <laughs> he has the mic. Oh, let me introduce you to my new friend, DJ Allen, who apparently, when he was growing up, played with himself all the time. <laughs> And that's how I got introduced to my Henderson Leadership Henderson <laughs> class. Now, an underdog, an underdog story is 10 months later, they did ask me to be the keynote speaker at graduation. So I came back and made up for it. But um, spent a lot of time on the street on Dogwood. Uh, we were on Dogwood, the 100 blocks. And, you know, like you talked about, the friends were just in walking distance. You know, and people knock on the door. Can he come out and play? Uh, it, that was it. And it was the street lights that brought you in. And so that's where I say I still had a little bit of that romantic era, and, and I'm really glad I had that when I was a little bit younger. Cool. Um, one more, well, maybe a couple more questions. Um, one of them, I was asked this, today, you know, if you're a kid, during the summer, you go swimming all the time. People have pools in the backyard, all that sort of thing. I'm guessing that wasn't necessarily the case, so I'm, I'm wondering, did you swim? Was there some place to go to do that sort of uh, for entertaining? Uh, absolutely. Um, my mother, for several, three or four years, was, uh, she helped manage the Red Cross swimming uh, uh, organization, and they would go down to uh, Vegas Wash in Lake Mead, and we'd take buses down with kids, and it was different age kids at different times, but I would go down with her at the beginning, so I would be there literally all day long, uh, swimming, and I'll never forget, I was, I think I was nine, and my sister was, uh, was uh, 13, and we swam, I mean, I could, I mean, I 
swam all the time. And we started swimming across, if you remember the ones that wrote, you could go across Vegas, Washington, about four miles, you could get to the other side. And we started swimming. And we were halfway there, because I could swim and then just float and swim and float. But they all got all panicked and came and, and picked us up. But we used to swim there. And then when, the, uh, when they built the uh, uh, youth center, uh, that was, it was, I, I think I was in junior high school. And I spent uh, literally every waking hour over there, either in the youth center itself playing uh, ping pong or they used to have snooker. And I got to be very good at ping pong and very good at snooker, which made me some money when I went to Yale and playing these kids with pocket <laughs> pool because that's a much easier game than, than uh, snooker is. Uh, and then the other half of the day would be in the swimming pool uh, there. Uh, every day, every kid was there uh, probably from 8 in the morning until 5 at night when you had to go home. And then the other thing is that my father was an avid boater. And so we went out on the boat all the time. He loved to fish, loved to swim. I loved to water ski, and my sister and my mother did. So we would make a deal with them, and, and I'd go out with them in the morning, and we would fish. And then everybody else would come, my friends and stuff, and we'd go out in the boat, and then we'd water ski for the rest of the day. And I'll never forget, we'd come in through uh, uh, where the uh, dam is, and look at that, and there's a little canyon up there, and we used to pull in there at the end of the day and, and have a Coke, uh, a soft drink and stuff, and I'll never forget, you know, probably every four or five times we went in there, you'd hear this click, 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 and you'd look up on the real steep caves, and you'd see these mountain sheep coming down, and you'd see the males just set up a perimeter, and the, and the, the females and the little ones would go down, get their drinks, go up, and then they would orderly go down and get a drink and go back up. It was just, you know, the nature that you could see in doing stuff like that, to me, was always left a great impression. Um, same with me. Uh, the Henderson Recreation Center, when they built the swimming pool, was unbelievable. I mean, that was where we went all the time, and that's where every day you went up there and, uh, and spent four or five hours. And then Pete... Uh, Pete's dad built the swimming pool in his backyard, and so I'd go over and swim at Pete's house, but Pete and I quickly remembered or figured out that the only two girls that we were going to see if we were in his backyard were these two right here <laughs> who, who lived on each side of, of Pete's house, and they were older, and so we'd spy on them for a while, and, and then we'd get bored, and we'd end up at the Henderson Recreation Center swimming pool, so it, it, the, the swimming pools were great, but... Um, this is a little bit of a diversion, but Patty's father was, his name was Bruce Trent. And some of you may have known Bruce Trent from Las Vegas. And there's a big park in Vegas right by a TPC named Bruce Trent Park. And it's named after Patty's dad. And he built, um, he was the, the first recreation director for the city of Las Vegas and was responsible for building all of the swimming pools in Las Vegas when there weren't any swimming pools for the public. And uh, so Patty and I would talk about our swimming days, and they were always the same, how you went to the swimming pool early in the morning, and you didn't go home till night. You know, so the kids in Vegas were doing the same thing we were doing here, but that, whoever came up with that idea, Lou, I wouldn't doubt if it wasn't you, but that recreation center was fantastic. That's where it's a, a little bit different with our generation. You didn't go to public pools as much. Um, but I did spend time at... at at Williams Pool, but basic, the new basic, if you will, and, and BMI. Uh, but it bring up a bad subject because swimming lessons were the bane of my existence as a child. I kid you not. I hated summers because of swimming lessons, um, which is funny because years later, and I've been in a lot of pools since, I've never done a dead man's float or had to float on my back for 30 seconds. Um, uh, we, we, uh, we had friends... Um, we had a friend down the street with a above ground pool, which you could touch. Again, didn't need the swimming lessons. Um, I'm taking a mild shot at my mom right now, just so you know. Um, no, I'm joking. But didn't have a friend, and, and this is a true story. I didn't like swimming because swimming lessons were terrible to me. I was forced to do it. And I was an okay swimmer, but, you know, had to get to this certain time. I was like, I can survive. Um, and I had a friend in high school, my buddy Walt, who had, they had an in-ground pool. And I remember, like, you know, people talk about wanting to go swimming, hanging out by the pool, and we're going to grill. And I'm like, pool, that's terrible. <laughs> and then I did it, and I was like, wow, that's fun. Um, now, that being said, wi uh, Wet and Wild opened when we were in high school. So we'd go out to Vegas and have Wet and Wild. And some of the rides were fun, but my biggest uh, uh, 
memory from Wet and Wild and all my friends and memory is we played beach volleyball one day uh, for about eight hours and I didn't put any protection on my feet. <laughs> and I was working at Blockbuster Video at the time at Major and Boulder. I probably met most of you there, you just don't know it. Uh, make sure your movies are back by midnight Tuesday. Um, rewind them, please. Um, and, and my mom had to make booties out of my dad's handkerchiefs just so I could walk because I had burned my feet so bad at, at Wet n' Wild. But um, yeah, I, I did probably meet a lot of people in this room at Blockbuster Video. You just didn't know that. That's pretty exciting. Unless you're a video time person. <laughs> <laughs> or on this side of the tracks. All right. Um, one last thing, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, I'm curious, we heard about the polar and the fact that you didn't want to be there in a Bishop Gorman coat. Um, the Arctic you know. Arctic Circle. It was the Arctic Circle. Oh, the Arctic I Circle. Mean, okay, I, I heard polar. I there you go. Yep. One, yeah. But what were the other businesses for high school kids? Where, where did you hang out? Well, for me, uh, <clears throat> um, Las Vegas was where we hung out, which was Tip Top, uh, which was on Charleston and um, Las Vegas Boulevard. That was the biggest hangout. And then the Blue Angel, which was down by Larry Ruvo's Italian restaurant on Charleston and, and uh, Fremont. That was the two big hangout places where everybody would go. And there was another little one on, on uh, Maryland Parkway in Charleston called Black Hats. And that's where kids would hang out, too. But they, when um, I was in... Uh, Probably my junior and senior year, they started a, a club called the Team Beat Club. Does anybody remember the Team Beat Club? Yeah, and it was a place that, uh, it was a dance place, and uh, everybody would, that was very, very popular in the summertime. And um, so we would go there too. But um, once I got to high school, I didn't spend a lot of time back in Henderson going to things. I was kind of an, an outsider, although I got along with everybody, but it's still, I, was, I wasn't a Henderson kid anymore. I was a, a Gorman guy, so it was... A little bit awkward, you know, and um, um, but uh, we did the same things the kids were doing in Henderson. I mean, we're all pretty much the same. And you know, um, I was just feeling just to make a little quick comment. I felt terrible when I heard Louis Shoup died. He was one of the stars too. And you know, you, you don't think about it, but you know, Frank went to Yale and Louis Shoup went to Stanford. I mean, basic high school put some kids out. I mean, and both of them played. I mean, that's pretty uh, impressive and. I'm sure you can go through the years and see the same thing all the time, but for a little bitty town to have that is a pretty big deal. That's the last good thing I'm saying about you. <laughs> well, I'll just briefly say one of the most humiliating things ever he ever said, and he didn't mean it that way. We were walking, and this is I was single, and we're walking into a place called Good Time Charlie's where all the girls hung out and all the guys hung out trying to meet all the girls. And I'm getting ready to walk in. I'm feeling real good about myself, and in walks Mike and with Pete, the porter. And Mike says, gee, you're Frank Shrek, aren't you? And I said, yeah. He said, I really admired you when you were, when I was really young. <laughs> I said, that's great. It makes me feel real good now going inside here. Because he was a little bit older then. But yeah, I, we always, we hung out at the Arctic Circle. That was a place that all the kids did. Uh, at that time, Bill Boyd owned El Dorado. So I remember when we played on our little league teams, we would go over there and build Typical, his son is no different, and just in, but does it in different ways. Would come out and give us free cokes and free things. That's what happened in Henderson all the time. Uh, when we were able to drive cars, then we went into the, to the Blue Angel. But also, even before that, Sills and the Roundup Drive-In. Some of you remember that. Uh, when our parents would take us there, and then my parents and, and, uh, uh, if some of you remember the the, the prices. Uh, Frank at Price, and and uh, the, my parents were, with them, just avid uh, Mexican food people, and so they'd go out to El Cholo's. Uh, they're all the time Hortensia. I don't know why I remember her name, but because but my sister and I didn't like Mexican food, and so there was the White Rabbit that was down the street that was next to Anderson Dairy, where you get hamburgers and, and, uh, and milkshakes. So that's kind of the stuff that we did. You know, we were lucky at, at BASIC because I know they did have a, a great winning tradition in athletics in the 50s and 60s. And 
if you are aware of basic football history, in the early 80s, it was like a 50-game losing streak. It was awful. Um, I was fortunate because the beginning of the 90s, there was actually a little run there where they, they qualified for zone a few times. And um, we were we had a lot of school spirit. And I think it gone away for a little while, but our little time, and again, I think it goes back to what my parents had taught me, what I knew about basic. Um, so it was fun to even, even in the early 90s, those Friday nights, I wouldn't work at Blockbuster on Friday night. I'd close on Saturday nights. This is when I was 16. I'd close on Saturday nights and I'd open on Sunday, but I don't work on Fridays because I was doing something school-wise. And, and so in the falls, it'd be, actually be wrapped around basic high school football, which that's still great to know. Again, I, I caught a little bit of that romantic period at the end. Um, you mentioned the El Dorado. Even for us in, in the 90s, they had the 99-cent breakfast. Um, of course, they didn't start that till 11, and we had a midnight curfew. You know, fortunately, none of us live more than five minutes away, uh, but I think they cut that off a few years after us, too. We caught the tail end a lot of stuff, because if you're in casino marketing, that doesn't make sense to have a whole bunch of 16, 17-year-old kids coming in for a 99-cent breakfast. I do not believe we're the target audience. Um, so, so we did that. Uh, two other quick things is we were also some of the last of an open campus for lunch. And I think of it now as I have a 16-year-old daughter. I'm so glad we have a closed campus. <laughs> because we would run, run. This would be my sophomore and, and junior year. My senior year, I, I, I got out early and usually went to work. But we would run, you know, who was ever driving. Of course, then you could have trucks and just pile in the back. And so you're at basic, and I, there used to be that middle road that cut in between there and Merrill Park. And it was a race to either Taco Bell or Wendy's. I mean, a race. And, I mean, it's kind of, fortunately, nothing happened. But now looking back, as I have a 16-year-old, I'm glad they didn't do that. Um, but the two places that come to mind, and they're still a part of my life, they're a part of my kid's life, is uh, Casa Verde had just opened. And it's now become Johnny Max. And so that was something that if you didn't have a car, you could walk up. And it was really small. It was go in, buy a slice of pizza and a Coke. And it was later on, I think, as we're in high school or right after it changed to Johnny Max. And so that's just been a big part of my life. Every birthday it was a Henderson special, you know, 50 wings and a pizza. My friend Walt and I could go eat a whole Henderson special, right, like lose two pounds. <laughs> now if I want to have one piece of pizza and 10 wings, I need a plan on a month <laughs> to do it. Um, but then the other one is El Torito became a hangout late. Where we, we just, and, and our group of friends, it was kind of laid back. We just like to go eat. But I do remember El Torito, the challenge would be to see if someone drink the whole sauce, the whole bowl of sauce. <laughs> uh, but the number four still tastes the same 25 years later. And um, I don't think they've sold any of the gifts in the little gift shop that they had. <laughs> was that like, you always wanted it opened, right? It's going to be open this time. I didn't realize back then you could probably just ask someone if you wanted to buy something. But if anybody wants to buy me some turquoise, I'm open. You know, I remember we used to, Arctic Circle was always jammed at lunchtime, and we'd go down and have a, a, what they'd call a very healthy lunch, a, a uh, lemon-lime Coke and a bag of French fries. That was, that was lunch. But there was a big line, and so, you know, I was always a little devious, so I, I got myself appointed captain of the, of the uh, guard patrol that put kids, you know, on the street to help the little kids get across. But as the captain, I didn't have to do any of that work. I just got everybody assigned. So I got to the Arctic Circle quicker than everybody else. <laughs> I got my food. But why was I thinking Polar Queen? Was there a Polar Queen? There was a Polar Queen, but not, not, yeah, it was after. I don't know. Did, they, did the Arctic Circle change to a Polar Queen? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. The Arctic Circle moved down the street. Oh, it moved down? I remember what was, oh, the A&W place. I love that. When it, during our f senior football season, they had that down there, and all the good-looking girls worked there, you know, older ones, younger ones, and and uh, we had the two-a-day practices, which, you know, really weren't even fun in those days, where you'd go in the morning and practice, and then you'd go in the afternoon and practice. In between those two practices, uh, we would go down to the Arctic Circle, and everybody would get those big, giant cones of the of the root beer, which was so good, I don't know why they went out of business, just bad business people, because that was a great product. And, and just all of us would drink one and, and kind of just admire the girls, because they were generally all older than I was. But that was the season we were getting ready to uh, beat Gorman in the semifinals. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, uh, this has nothing to do with what we're talking about either, but I was a paper boy, and I had different routes, different times, and all over the city, but one of my routes was down off of uh, St. Rose, which is St. Rose now in Lake Mead. And I went to collect on, um, every month you went around, and you got $2 for the Las Vegas Sun. It's $2 a month. And this guy came to the door, and he only had one leg. And I remember going home and telling my dad, I said, Dad, this man only had one leg. It's the first time I'd ever seen somebody with only one leg. And she, he says, yeah, that is Michael Callahan. And Michael Callahan only had one leg. And I remember seeing him later, next time I went and collected money, he was there again, and I asked him about his leg. And he told me all about how the war was, the Korean War, and what happened. He was just a really nice guy. You know, um, everybody used to always laugh about going to Gorman, and you got to make all these connections and meet all these different people, which you did. But when you think about Henderson, you know, that Michael Callahan, he took care of everybody. He, he Frank went to work for them to get him elected. And then Frank ends up being head of the Game and Control Board. I mean, that's pretty big stuff. Uh, and he did that with a whole bunch of kids. Remember Daryl Monahan? And Daryl was the head of the tourism for the state of Nevada. And you could go through this list of people, but the Henderson people really took care of the Henderson people. And uh, obviously, Michael Callahan really did a great job. Yeah, I could tell you how most of you that know Michael Callahan under, would understand this, but Michael Callahan was a giant Irishman who got his leg blown off from his knee down in Korea as a 19-year-old sergeant. He was way out in the front when the Chinese first invaded. And he stayed out 28 hours, stuck his stump in the snow, froze it so he didn't bleed to death, tied a, got a tourniquet around his leg, eventually got all his men back that were alive. I know my father was working with another person. They eventually got a silver star. He should have probably got the Congressional Medal of Honor for what he did. But Mike was a guy that was really tough, but very fair. Uh, but he wasn't afraid to do things that maybe were unconventional, and appointing me to the Nevada Gaming Commission was very unconventional. <laughs> I was uh, 26 years old, uh, got out of law school. I was integrating the elementary schools and leading all the anti-war demonstrations, and I was half the age of anybody uh, ever appointed to the Nevada Gaming Commission, yet, you know, this guy had enough confidence and faith in me to go ahead and do that, which changed, number one, Talking me in to go to Yale was a great thing, but this changed my whole life because after I got off the gaming commission, you know, for the last 45 years I've been a gaming lawyer. So just a tremendous man, and probably if you got kids that were around during that period of time, everyone can tell you a story how he posit positively impacted their life, if not totally changed it. We could probably do a whole thing on Mike. Um, I, one more story, because I about Mike and and. He was, uh, the, so he's a publisher of the Henderson Home News, but he was at the Las Vegas Sun, and he'd call, and the receptionist would say, you know, Tim, Mike's on 101. Tim was his son, who was the general manager, and it was never Mike just called to say, I hope you have a great day. Right. Paul, that was Paul Sedelko, the managing editor, who was there for so many years. Paul, Mike's on 101, and everybody would just, you know, it, it happened on deadline day, you know, so a, cu a couple times a week, and I had been there probably for a couple years. DJ? Mike's on 101, and this is back when we're actually paginating, laying out the paper where you're cutting with the X-Acto knives and glue, and there's about six people back there laying out, and they look at me, <gasps> like, what did you do? <laughs> and I'm scared. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm 19, 20 years old. I'm scared. I go around the corner. I pick up the phone. This is DJ. He says, DJ, this is Mike. Johnny Denton just signed with the Miami Dolphins. What do you think? And Johnny Denton was a quarterback for the Green Valley Gators and they had gone to UNLV and, and had some issues. But for a little while, he had, he, had, he had played a little pro football. But I remember being so scared, like, what did I do? And Mike just wanted to talk a little football. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's how wild is that? I mean, if you even think about, um, you know, the different generations and the impact um, that, that Mike had and to this day still friends with Tim, uh, but just good people, you know, and I've looked at that with whether it be the Gibsons in some way, how they've had an impact on my life, my family's life, um, you know, having worked with the Henderson Home News, the Green Spuns were involved with that. Um, you know, I, I was at the Golden Nugget recently speaking to their, their team, and it hit me right before I um, was speaking to them that I went to UNLV. Don't be intimidated by my UNLV education there. Um, <laughs> 
because you know, I went to UNLV, and part of that was the Golden Nugget Scholarship, uh, the foundation. And, and, you know, part of the scholarships I got, Michael Callahan was actually the chairman of the scholarship fund. And he didn't know me at the time, and it hit me that day that here I am doing leadership development for their leadership team. And it was actually through the Golden Nugget Foundation and Mike that, you know, it's just funny how this comes around full circle. And, again, it's this community. Is, it's, it keeps going. It does, it's not stopping with, with people like me. It's still going today because of what Henderson, what you started, what, what predecessors started. It's a special place, and it keeps giving back. Okay. Do you mind if we take uh, some questions from the audience? Oh. No? Okay. Just not my mom. <laughs> Does anyone have a question that you'd like to ask? Boy, you've wowed them. Looks like a basic I, high school class when I went That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we have one right here. Yes, babe. It was on the, I'm, I'm directionally challenged, but it was on the east side of Boulder Highway. It was yeah. Victory Village. Boulder Highway Saint and Saint Lake Mead Boulevard. Churches. Yeah. It was on the south side there. Do you, there do you was, know where St. Peter's Church is? Yeah. That was, the, that was Victory Village right behind it. Mm -hmm. That and Victory right, Village and then Carver Park was further down the road. They had two. And they were, the street. they were, they were uh, smaller uh, government-built houses for people that were coming to work in the plant. But what they did have in, in uh, reminded me, in, in Victory Village, and we used to go down during the summertime, they had mulberry trees. Yeah. Oh, they yeah. got so many mulberries, they would come all the way to the ground. And they were as good a fruit as anything you can buy today. We'd just go get as many bags of it as we could. Because we were helping the tree, because the branches were all so full of fruit all the way down the ground. So that's my favorite memory of Victory Most, Village. I would say, um, I want to say 50% of the people that I knew in Henderson lived in Victory Village at one time or another. I mean, they all moved yeah. eventually yeah. up the streets and kind of moved around a bit, but most, lot, most people started in Victory Village, and it was uh, extremely inexpensive, and obviously, and you got what you paid for it there, too. But it was a good place. It was a nice place to live for people. We didn't know we didn't have money. Nobody had any money. I, where my house was, my row, right behind there was a place called Vicky's Ranch House Bar. You guys, <laughs> well, you guys probably knew it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then there was another place called the the back door bar, which is behind the gas station. And the reason why I mention those places, they were the place to go for grown-ups on the weekend. I mean, they, those places were jam-packed. It was great for me because I got a job picking up beer cans on Sunday morning. I got paid to go out and pick up all the beer cans around uh, that bar. And so it was a great job. It was really good. When I was in high school, I had one of the best jobs you could possibly get. There was a, a laundromat. Um, Right by the intersection there, Lake Mead and, and um, the Boulder Highway, whatever, what was the grocery store there? I don't want to say it was Smith's, but it was. It was Wonder World. Yeah, Wonder World. Wonder World. Yeah. There was a laundromat there that the Paramours owned. I don't know if you guys remember the Paramore family. But they owned a laundromat, and I got paid to go down to that laundromat and clean it at 5 in the morning. And I got paid a bunch of money. Well, I was going to high school, so I could go down there and make myself $15 a day for cleaning that laundromat, and I mean, today you would never go to a laundromat at 5 in the morning. In Henderson, you could do that. There was never a problem with that. So those little places around here between the bar and that laundromat, you could make some money in those days. At least I thought you could. You know, one of the things that we were missed, uh, because I, it was literally uh, uh, before its time in Las Vegas, and, and it was one of the three best restaurants in Las Vegas, was the Swanky Club. Yeah. And it was the first actual buffet in Las Vegas. They called it a smorgasbord because I guess they were Swedish, you know, but it was literally the first buffet uh, in Las Vegas and, and between Railroad Pass and Swanky Club and the Green Shack, those were three of the, uh, outside of a hotel, that, those are the three best restaurants in town. But I remember all the times we went to the Swanky Club and I liked it because I don't like vegetables so I could get a lot of other stuff. There was a, a Kwanzaa <laughs> hut in Pittman and I'm trying to think of the name of the bar it was. It was a Kwanzaa hut. Was it a sportsman? The reason why I, I remember it was because of, who is the famous? Jim Thorpe. Jim, Jim Thorpe, Thorpe. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. worked there. He owned it. He, did yep. he own it? Yep. And my dad used to take me down there to, yep. to meet Jim Thorpe. I never went there. 
But I'll bet my dad had 50 or 60 beers taking me down there. Just to say, <laughs> he'd say, let's stop in there and meet Jim Thorpe. And we'd stop in there and he'd drink a couple of beers and there'd be no Jim Thorpe. I'd never met him, never met the guy. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. I mean, another person who needs to be mentioned because she's still alive and she, she was the banker to all of us as we grew up. I had my little $2 account and as I would, you know, mow a lawn or do something else, paint a fence, I'd put my money in her bank and that's Selma Bartlett who just as... Uh, and she's never forgotten Henderson. She was the banker in Henderson, and when she got in with another big bank, uh, I happened to be on a board of directors with her, and she always kept calling it, you know, Henderson Bank. It didn't do anything else, but it's another really great product of Henderson, Nevada, who helped all the kids that grew up there learn how to save. And when I was in college, she would notify my parents if I was overdrawn, <laughs> 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 which unfortunately was quite often. <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's a, a, a lady on TV now, um, and it, her name is Denise Rausch. Do you guys know who yeah. I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. Now help me with this one, because I might be making this up. But <laughs> I, I think we moved into her grandparents' house on Major Avenue. Dennis Rausch. Dennis Rausch. Was he a quarterback? Yes. Yeah. And a, and a great baseball player, too. Yeah, that's, and that was their house. They moved out, and we moved in. And I always think it's funny now, I watch TV and there's the granddaughter and she's, yeah, small world. That's yes, John. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on this, but I think you should have quite an evening to talk about uh, the influence of Henderson and Henderson folks on uh, union labor in the valley, especially building the trades, because it's a, it's, I think it's an impressive history Blackie and his son, and, and uh, Danny, geez, who? Danny Thompson. Danny Thompson. Yeah. And who, who, was, who was the other one? Uh, uh, nice looking, kind of blondish hair. Passed away probably 10, 15 years ago. He was another one. They were all, I mean, Blackie ran the FLCIO. Exactly. Yeah. My dad was actually the business agent for uh, bricklayers, terrazzo workers, and tile workers. And my dad was president. Yeah. And you know what they did? They were the first ones in, in Southern Nevada to start a health plan. There was no such thing as health insurance. None of the, none of the workers had health insurance. And when they negotiated their deal, they put an extra quarter, an hour, into their hourly to, to start a health nice insurance program. It was the start of it really all. Nice looking guy. And, uh, that was, that's right. Jake, that, Jake, that could be a oh, oh I, I know the first deal. Jack? Jeffries. Jack Jeffries. That's who I was trying to remember. Um, I will tell you, John, that since the board of the Henderson Historical Society is here, I think you've made your comment to, in the right audience because they, they've, you know, they have a subcommittee that puts together these and they're always looking for good ideas. And I have a feeling, given that you're sitting with some of them, they may not be telling you they're listening, but trust me, they are. You know. So that's a good thing. Um, I think we can take one or two more questions if we have any. Uh, yes, ma'am. You know why my son never that about the radio? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I will let him answer, but I will tell you that there are still stories I never told my folks when they were alive. The so, statute of limitations. I, that's I, right. I've, I've consulted my attorney. <laughs> <laughs> But just think, Thanksgiving is coming up. I think you'll have a, something for the conversation over the dinner table. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, I'd like to thank, thank our you. panel. I think this was a fascinating uh, talk tonight. You guys all did great. Thank you very much.